to not just share an email with somebody, but provide context to that email and, and talk about the solutions, think about how do we do it differently now? So I think governance and, and that threaded governance has become so much more important at the city level to address not only the effects of COVID, but the effects of climate change moving forward. Alyssa, you're speaking my language in terms of governance and deconstructing governance. Um, I remember when I first started at the mayor's office in LA, a coworker of mine took me to lunch and he took out a piece of paper and he drew the governance structure of city LA. And I took it and I put it on my wall and referred to it almost all the time in my job because you understand, you know, in terms of having those systemic changes, it means moving things around. It means combining the two jobs that you have now or the four jobs that you have now. Um, so uh, taking the city as it is, I'd like to turn to another very complicated industry, which is aviation. And Merion, um, put you on the spot a little bit in terms of, you know, you're relatively new to your job, um, relatively new to Air France. You joined during the pandemic and your experience has to have been crazy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about it. You know, what are some of the big changes that you're seeing uh, in the aviation industry and, and how are those manifesting in, in your role in your organization? Yeah, so I'm new to the airline industry. I indeed joined on April, April 6, 2020. So as you can imagine, it was an interesting journey to join the airline industry. I'm not new to sustainability. I used to work uh, for the banking uh, sector for 12 years. Um, and when I joined the sector, um, I was relatively new to the stats and the ratio and uh, the issues, although I had a like a big picture. And one of the figures that really uh, surprised me um, was the, the, the ratio, the, the, the contribution of the sector uh, out of the global uh, man-made uh, greenhouse gas emission. And the airline industry represents two to 3%. And personally, I thought, oh, that's probably around 20, 25%, which is not the case. It's not to diminish our contribution because the contribution is there. But it's just to show that uh, based on uh, the pre-COVID uh, global air traffic, so in uh, 2019, we do know that if we're not acting now, we're going to reach this 20, 25% very, very quickly. Um, but so that's a good number to remember. And um, the good news is the industry uh, is moving. Maybe people are going to say it's not moving fast enough. Yeah, maybe for sure, we have works to do, um, but it's moving. Uh, the uh, International Air Transport Association have been making a few commitments for many, many years now. The most recent plan have been announced early October this year, uh, which is the net zero path uh, by 2050. Uh, the good news is that uh, the industry is moving. We actually have a, a coalition just uh, created uh, two weeks ago uh, with uh, Global Airline on uh, the decarbonization, uh, to work on decarbonization and innovation uh, in partnership with the uh, Boston uh, Consulting Group. The reason why we need to work all together in partnership is because none of the solutions that are existing right now are going to be able to fill the gap. We have solution. Um, I'm going to name a few after that, but it's not enough um, in terms of tech maturity, the cost, the scale, it's really not enough. So we're going towards the right direction. We need to work uh, with emerging technology to de-risk to de-risk the path to net zero because everybody agree we need to do things but when it comes to actually make decision and money on the table um, it's a bit more complicated so that's for the industry uh, air france klm um, we've been working on climate for many years the first climate plan was published in 2008 so it's not something new uh, and Despite the pandemic, so that's why it's tricky. I joined the industry in April 2020, but I think it was the perfect timing because everybody paused uh, their, their trips uh, by plane. And the spotlight on our industry was really massive. People asking questions about what are the solutions, 
what are the sustainable solutions that does exist right now, et cetera. So for me, it was the perfect opportunity. And Air France, I pursued commitments, so net zero by 2050. Uh, most recently, we're aligned with the science-based target initiative. So it means that we're going to have extra CO2 reduction targets by 2035 to just make sure we're on track. Because it's, it's not easy to just say, well, we're going to be net zero by 2050. OK, what does it mean? What does it mean for tomorrow? Uh, two main lever levers at Air France KLM, fleet renewal. So you saw probably a lot of plane parked on um, airports during the pandemic. And there was a great opportunity for us to put in early retirement the most polluting aircraft, um, having a new aircraft. So for example, on Air France, we have the A350. And uh, for people living on the West Coast, if you uh, fly between Seattle and Paris, you're going to have the chance to fly on that new aircraft. Reduction of 20, 25% of CO2 emissions. We're quite excited to have that aircraft in our fleet. So fleet renewal, the other one is sustainable aviation fuel. Everybody's talking about it, that's great. The scale is not there, lack of infrastructure, lack of supply. So we want to stimulate that. We want the customer to understand what does it mean, corporate customer, B2C customer. To explain the technology here in Los Angeles, we're actually sourcing SAF um, at World Energy uh, in LAX. Uh, for a flight uh, on KLM between uh, Los Angeles and Amsterdam. Um, so we want to accelerate the change and we want a customer to be part of the journey with us. So yeah, exciting time, a lot of things going on. It was not boring at all. I had a very busy year, um, but it's great to see that people ask questions and there is a big piece of awareness of explaining what is available. And, you know, I would like to have hydrogen and electric you know, aircraft tomorrow, but entry uh, into service dates are not before 2035, and we don't have the luxury to wait. We need to act now with the solution that are currently available. So that's it for me. Excellent. Well, thank you. And I'd like to call attention to three things that you said. So first of all, Seattle to Paris, really? That's going to be your first flight using the A350? We're in LA. Marion, has jean Rossant not made the pitch yet for you to take that to LA I'm instead? I'm going to build a case for that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that works for me. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, we don't care. Um, <laughs> Uh, second point that you made was um, around emerging technology and trying to, you know, look at benefit from emerging technology. And I think that's especially true for electric aviation or decarbonized aviation. And then for something that's near and dear to John Rossant's heart, to Commotion LA and to LA is urban air mobility. Um, and one of the organizations I'm a part of, Urban Movement Labs, is really pioneering that UAM partnership with and for the community. Um, and so uh, we might have to revisit that on that topic or revisit that on this panel. The third thing I wanted to call attention to you and the pivot over to Adam actually is around uh, the percentage of uh, trans or of emissions that aviation represents. I didn't realize it was two to 3%. I also thought it was 25%. Yeah, most of the people think that way. So Adam, 25%. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what you all are doing in the auto industry around systemic. Just, just a little change in the auto industry at the moment. So let's talk about electrification. <laughs> Uh, but no, let's start with emissions, actually. So it, it's, it really is the driver around emissions. And the emissions breaks down into all kinds of different areas beyond, beyond the obvious. The obvious that we're all watching at the moment with the switch to electrification. Uh, and I will speak about that. But it's across the whole, the whole value chain. Um, and you have to start with the, with the end in mind. Uh, and you start right at the beginning with uh, what you can do around the material sourcing that you've got going on. How can you go for secondary first? And really, at that point, in vehicle design, start taking uh, carbon out of the, the, the footprint through the whole value chain. Uh, then out of production, so sourcing, production, then obviously the use case, we'll come to that in a minute. And then you've got to think about what are you going to do towards the end of life cycle. So sustainability is at the core of our strategy, and it goes way beyond just what we have in terms of vehicles and, and what you read about the most in the press. Then you do get to the tailpipe, and obviously there's a big part there, um, which is the obvious place. And we have, I say, two things going on in parallel. The one is recognize there's going to be petrol engines around for quite a while, gas engines around for quite a while. So we continue to work on that to take emissions further and further down in that space, whilst at the same time pushing across to the uh, electrification side of things and bringing out more and more vehicles there and, and to give a sense of what we we got there i mean we'll have a million electric vehicles on the road already 
or electrified vehicles on the road if you take plug-in and, and battery electric vehicles for battery electric vehicles by the end of this year. And it's just a massive rollout across the portfolio. We're going to have 25 uh, models by the end of 23. And this is what we need to do with other partners in the industry, the other manufacturers, to make sure that there's a broad consumer choice there. So all size and shapes of vehicles, small to large, um, that there's real choice for consumer to be able to engage with electrification and make it easy to switch, which is partly the model, but then also having range and make it easy to, to, to make that switch. And we'll come to infrastructure maybe a little bit later. Um, so what we have there is a big push around rolling that across the portfolio. Um, and in doing so, the, across the whole of the uh, life cycle, we will reduce uh, emissions by 40% from 2030 versus 2019 um, and continue to push that forwards. We have flexible manufacturing, so we can switch fairly quickly to electrification as the market goes. I really appreciate that you framed it in terms of life cycle emissions and in terms of looking at sustainability from start to finish to start again. I find in many of my conversations, it's only about tailpipe emissions, which among um, my other pet peeves is, is one of them. Um, <laughs> you know, if we are going to have electrification of vehicles, we need to think about, you know, overall, um, what are those life cycle emissions? And then also what other impacts do cars have? Um, so definitely appreciate that framing. Um, so now going from the auto industry to the micro mobility industry, um, you know, sometimes uh, in order to see the change or in order to believe the change, you have to see the change. And I think micromobility and particularly micromobility 2.0 is, is a big part of that. So, Kyle, I'd love to invite you um, to, to talk a little bit about your journey, um, you know, at, 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 uh, uh, in micromobility and also um, some of the projects that you see really driving that transformational change towards sustainable, tra uh, sustainable transfer transportation. Thank you. Yeah, um, so there's really two projects that I can think of that come to mind uh, in terms of scaling transformational change in the business. So we're, and I think the theme here is about bringing everyone along on the uh, electric, electric, electrified and, uh, you know, green mobility revolution and, and not uh, impacting users who are getting around in other ways. So the, fir the first project I'll, I'll call out um, that's, you know, very local scale, you can see the change happening, like you said. Um, in Bakersfield, we, la we launched past, uh, last Monday, and it's a program that includes both uh, scooters and e-bikes. And in partnership with Golden Empire Transit, we're doing a uh, universal basic mobility pilot. So 100 uh, low-income residents in Bakersfield will have free access to transit, scooters, and e-bikes for a year. Um, the goal here is to get the most disadvantaged users in this community guaranteed access to transportation and to make sure that they can access education, training, and job opportunities. Um, now, we're also going to follow through on how that actually played out. So UC Davis is doing the research. UC Davis will be tracking the, the social and economic uh, outcomes of this pilot. And, and I'm hoping that by the next commotion event, we can probably come with some of the, the, the research findings. But um, yeah, that, that program just launched, uh, vehicles hit the ground and, and we're signing up users and part of this universal basic mobility pilot. Um, the second one is similar flavor, but it's about reducing the impact that can happen with uh, how micromobility is it around the city and, and how pedestrians are potentially impacted. So um, SPIN announced uh, SPIN Insight Level 2, uh, uh, powered by Drover AI, um, which is here at the conference. Uh, this is a new technology. It's a, it's a computer vision and um, uh, AI-based uh, lane detection and parking correction uh, detection uh, tool on our vehicles. And, and you can see and mostly hear this, this change in that um, in Santa Monica, Seattle, San Francisco, Atlanta, Miami, our vehicles will let you know if you're in the wrong place. And it's not based off of geofence, it's based off of computer like cameras. Um, and we announced a partnership just yesterday with Blue Systems, also here at the, at the conference, to bring this data, um, daylight this data for cities. So not only are we giving active real-time feedback to the user when they go up on a curb ramp and start riding on the sidewalk, 
Um, their vehicle in Seattle gives them an audio uh, feedback they shouldn't be there. In Santa Monica, the vehicle actually slows down to a pedestrian speed. Um, we are now bringing that data in a dashboard format to the city. So, so MDS, many folks here probably know about it, but if you don't, um, it's the mobility data specification. It's basically the, the data spec that uh, is used in our industry to communicate between vendors and cities. Hasn't evolved yet to include um, sidewalk riding events or real-time parking feedback. And so we're working with Blue Systems to get a little ahead of the ball and, and bring that data um, to cities so that they can say, hmm, we have a bike lane here, but yet we still see people on the sidewalk a lot. Perhaps this bike lane is constantly barked, uh, blocked with, with Ubers. Um, we should maybe add physical protection to this facility and make it uh, a more accessible and, and better operating facility. So yeah, I mean, the, the goal with this project is really to reduce the impact of pedestrians and, and hopefully give cities better tools to plan how their infrastructure is built. Excellent. And Kyle, you're kind of a poster child for conferences in terms of two of your other partners are at Commotion LA. I mean, was your origin story here? Is there? <laughs> uh, no, so. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. we, we, just, we, just, yeah. we all got together. I was, I was trying to plug Commotion LA, but yeah. uh, next time, job, next time. Yeah. Um, the other question I had for the audience actually is who would like to see those results for the universal basic mobility pilot? because I would. I'm very interested to see what that what happens with that. Um, I know there's a number of universal basic mobility um, pilots that are happening across the country and we'll see how they're different, how they're the same and how they you know, kind of manifest um, good results, uh, hopefully nationally. Um, so one of the things I wanted to pick up on what you said is around the availability and the affordability, affordability of the vehicles and of the you know, scooters commensurate in that, you know, in terms of people using it is infrastructure. And Alyssa, I'm looking at you purposely <laughs> in terms of bike lane infrastructure, bus, you know, lane infrastructure. How are you all in San Diego, especially as you publish a revised climate action yeah. plan, um, thinking about supportive infrastructure for mode shift? Well, you stole my thunder there. <laughs> um, so we did uh, just update our climate action plan. So in my um, department, we released um, a plan, but going back to the governance statement, it was every single department in the city of San Diego provided feedback to that plan. And, and so before I go into the mobility piece, I want to share a little bit about that process because um, one of the problems that we have when we set metrics is can we implement it? Is it cost effective? And then can you monitor it? And so a big piece of the process of vetting the actions to achieve the targets of greenhouse gas emissions that we did in the city of San Diego was go to every single department, um, get a scoring of feasibility of implementation, uh, feasibility of, of, of cost, and then the brainstorming of how we're going to monitor. Uh, we included that in with a number of feedback points from our community-based organizations and residents in our underserved communities, where their four priorities were um, air quality, public health, jobs, and resiliency, and then putting that all together to help inform each of those actions on um, how they achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So I wanted to make a, a mention of that because I think that's a big piece as we talk more specifically about the mobility piece. So within our climate action plan, as with our 2015 climate action plan, strategy three is focused on a shift from um, mobile source emissions, which are about 50% for the city of San Diego. Anything down there? Decarbonizing. Don't give them. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I need your help. Um, <laughs> but it's also um, it's we wanted to shift the the commuter mode. Um, so those peak hour trips of people that live in transit priority areas. That's a small portion of the entire city of San Diego. That creates an us versus them as we seek to achieve goals for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So what we've done in this update to our climate action plan is about creating a mode share target that is 50% of all trips. Um, that means that if you need to, such as if you have a service vehicle or you have kids that you need to get around like I do or um, elderly family members or doing service industry, you can still have a car, um, but it will need to be electrified. 
um, for those who want to have a car will need to electrify and then moving towards the infrastructure that we need to support an efficient use of another mobility option. Um, it is about expanding mobility options, not taking away um, in any way, shape or form. So by creating all of these modes needing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, the infrastructure is important. And with that, we're working a lot on the big um, funding dollars that just came out. And um, I actually have my counterpart here, uh, Jorge Rivera, the director of transportation, and we'll really be looking at how we can capture those monies to repurpose our rights of way for all modes. Excellent. And one of the things that I wanted to pick up on in terms of what you said is mobility options, you know, having uh, not just the uniform system where the car is the only option, but being able to choose other things. And I know, um, although BMW is known for cars, you all are doing lots of other types of projects um, and uh, have lots of other uh, innovative, exciting things that you all are doing. So Adam wanted to uh, pitch it over to you to share um, some of the things that you all are working on, on that uh, sort of mobility options space, working with um, uh, government cities space uh, and how that is helping to um, both uh, push for the electric vehicle and then push for electric mobility more broadly. Sure. I mean, let's, let's talk a little, take a step back and, and refer to what was said about the research side of things. I think that that is key. The bottom line is how do we get people to engage with the right technologies to make the change, to make the change forwards. Okay. And you've got to, some of that is removing perceived obstacles, barriers, uh, and make sure you get that right. So we also work with UC Davis and doing research around whole different areas of fields, different technologies that could be applied. Uh, and with the, with the single objective as to how can we move it forwards and make, make sure that people do engage. Because this is something that you can't do on your own. You need friends, okay? We can put technology in vehicles and put a ton of electric vehicles out there, but if people are struggling to use them because um, they can't charge or because they have other concerns, then, then really we're only being, going to be able to make certain step forwards uh, to make that happen. So that's what we're looking at. The charging infrastructure is critical. Uh, we don't have enough. And that's something where we're now seeing encouraging signs with both local legislation, uh, but also what, what's just come from, from the, the federal level with an injection of cash that will help build that out. Um, that's only going to cover a certain amount of space across the nation. So, and, and I've had this conversation with people in White House, they're going to fund forwards, they're going to kickstart it, but they still need public sector or, or other private companies to come in and then build out from there and really get the ball rolling. But, but it's a very good start that I think is going to move us forwards in terms of, uh, in terms of that space. So, you know, on the policy side, a lot is around how can we encourage that level playing field so that everybody can get their electric product out there, make it accessible, uh, and that we can cater to as many different customers as possible, because I think we need to build momentum. We need to get as many electric cars on the road. There aren't many there now. It's a couple of percent of the market out of the 16 million vehicles that get sold every year in this country. We need to see more and more across a different variety of brands and shapes and sizes. Then people will realize this is something for me. And, and then you will see it roll and build and snowball and that's the action that we need to create as well. So we'll do it. we're doing our part to push out, but we need we need our friends around us to help cover some of the other things as well. Um, so that really is is one of the the obvious things that we're doing. Then we're also trying out lots of different things. How do, how do you access the right technologies for the bigger sustainability piece? Um, and and to that end, we have an in-house venture capital fund that is going out there and, and looking at different providers, different solutions uh, that maybe will work a lot faster than a big corporation. And how can we tap into that also to make sure that we get the right uh, pace of change? Uh, and we find innovative solutions that we may not find ourselves and we can tap in and move with that as well. So the, there are a number of things out there that will um, help us move quickly. BMW also has a bikes division, <laughs> motorbikes division. So we I know, are, I've seen them. Yeah. we are in that space. In fact, I've just, we've, we've had another event going in parallel. We've just, we're just launching uh, next year. We're launching an electric scooter um, with, uh, I think it's a 70 mile range or 80 mile range. Um, and, you know, that's going to play its part as well in terms of the urban solution. So it's beyond just the car. What other solutions can we bring across the whole range of vehicles and, uh, and get, do everything we can really. 
And just to clarify for the Americans in the room, scooter meaning moped or scooter meaning scooter. Kyle scooter? No, scooter, scooter means, sorry, sorry, confusing. Um, uh, scooter meaning moped. Yes. So like um, an electric Vespa, if you will, but, but a lot cooler than a Vespa. It sounds very cool. I'm, I'm excited to see that at the next commotion too. So we're going to have the results of the Davis uh, research, the other results of the Davis research, and then the, the new BMW moped. Um, one of the things you said um, was really interesting around you know partnerships, bringing together the different mobility options. Um, we've seen a lot over the past couple of years, this idea of shared mobility hubs and of bringing together um, the, the various modes into uh, intermodal passenger facilities, which is the name of an RFP that the Transportation Research Board just put out, um, if you all are looking for to do some research on, on things like that. Um, almost the kind of prototype of shared mobility hub is an airport. And uh, I know we don't think about it as that, um, but it does a really good job of combining short range, long range, medium range travel on the passenger transportation side. And so Marion uh, ask, uh, would ask you to talk a little bit about um, how travel to and from an airport uh, you know, shows sustainability or shows how a city might view sustainability, how it also integrates into how you're trying to decarbonize aviation. Um, and uh, how was LAX when you came in? <laughs> no, but just honestly, the first two questions, you don't have to talk about LAX. Um, no, I think um, the key word is always partnerships. I think uh, airports, uh, we share a bit of raison d'être here. Airports uh, bring a city closer to other cities. And airline, we, we share that uh, type of raison d'être. Um, and I think airports, um, they should be uh, a great opportunity to be a sustainable uh, mobility platform within a smart city, for example. And so for sure, we're discussing with airport authorities, um, with cities, cities uh, the whole ecosystem uh, in the cities. The reason why is because our customer journey or sustainable customer journey doesn't start when the passenger enter the aircraft. The journey starts when the passenger book, uh, books its ticket, um, leave his home or her home, going to the airport, uh, using the facility of the airport, etc. So I think we're interested to bring to the customer um, the available solution to make this the journey as sustainable as it can be. So it means we need to work with the airport on you know, carbon neutrality of the actual hub, the actual facility, but also uh, the solution to bring the customer to the airport. So for example, I don't know if you saw the pitch this morning of uh, WISC, uh, for me is, is a one of the future solution about a passenger, well, there is few challenges here, but the passenger going to the airport. Uh, right now, if I'm, I want to mention more, uh, short or medium solution is how we can work with scale rental company to make sure we have partnership to offer them uh, hybrid vehicles to go to the airport. So it's to and from the airport, within the airport itself, run emissions, working with our handlers or caterers, the whole ecosystem of the airport authorities, um, and, and to make sure we align with I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, but there is a number 17, which is partnership for the goals. And I think that's something that we should work on. Um, again, it's, it's tied to what we want to offer to customers. And people have questions. They will have questions on waste. What do we do on waste at the airport? Airport should be a platform, you know, offering green solution. And there is tons of opportunities. It's to bring the right person around the table, big organization, our client, airports authorities, cities, startups, everybody around the table. And I think events like today, well, no, today, yesterday, tomorrow, um, is bringing that into reality. And I, I think it was great to be in person because innovation, to share innovation, it's always great to be in person and share experience. Virtually, I found it a bit more difficult. And us airline, definitely the airport is the hub. It should be seen as, uh, you know, the smart city platform as something that we need to develop and put a lot of attention going forward. So I'm not working for an airport, but I'm really working with the airport authorities. <laughs> 
Yes, f- fair enough. Um, and I know I've, I've actually seen people taking scooters to and from an airport, so it can be done. And it was to LAX, so there you go. Um, but uh, Kyle, knowing that that's probably not the predominant form of transportation of getting to the airport, I wondered if you could share um, uh, some of what you all are doing, what you've seen also in your, your past experiences around shared mobility hubs and the importance of kind of bringing those uh, different modes physically together. Yeah, certainly. So uh, I think for, you know, we're obviously a more pedestrian scale service and uh, I, the OG mobility hub, the the train station, right, where we um, used to see lots of commerce and, you know, like a layer cake of mobility, you had train and then you had another layer of bus. I'm thinking about, you know, like Grand Central in New York. Um, that's, those are huge demand centers for us in, in most markets. Um, even, even ferries, for example, I, you know, I live in Seattle, I think that's clear. Um, and, uh, <laughs> the, the Coleman dock is a ferry right in downtown Seattle, where people, uh, is a passenger ferry. People go to various communities around the Puget Sound, um, by boat. And there's, uh, a passenger ferry that runs, um, peak hour, uh, AM and PM. And if you go down there, um, uh, at four or 5 PM in the afternoon, you're seeing tons of scooters and bikes. And it just, it's very obvious. This is, this is the clearest, fastest way to get from anywhere in downtown Seattle to your, your ferry ride home. Um, so th- those locations have always been major hubs. It's, it's it, you know, the brains in the wall, we've always deployed there and seen lots of trips there, but you know, as we developed and got a little more sophisticated on how we think about our operations, how we think about serving the customer and making sure the vehicle is ready and charged, um, we found a new way to, to kind of serve those, those hubs. So um, a great example of this would be like the Caltrain station in, in SF. So in, in that location, we have installed a, a 16 bay charging station for our scooters. So when a user ends their the trip at Caltrain, they can plug their, they first they park correctly because the station encourages them to come to the right spot. Second, they can they can plug their scooter in and, and have it charged. That does a few things. It both um, charges the scooter for the next user so that we don't have dead scooters waiting around at the train station, but it also reduces how much our operations vans need to come and visit these very high pedestrian volume areas. We don't want to have to make trips uh, down King Street to the station when we can have that service kind of uh serving itself and getting recharged and being available for the next user. So we definitely think about those pedestrian scale mobility hubs as areas that we need to serve both with our vehicle availability, but also sometimes with our infrastructure that it has benefits both to the city, the customer and spin. Excellent. Well, thank you. I am going to open it up to audience questions after I ask my last question to the panelists, and I'm going to invite each of you to answer it. Um, so when I was asked to moderate this panel, the new normal, I, um, uh, I have to admit, I almost kind of crossed out like the new normal because I hate that phrase and <laughs> thinking about, you know, what, what is the new normal? What does that even mean? Um, but rather, you know, wanted to call it like the future we want and how to get there. And so um, my final question to you all is, you know, in your industry for you, for mobility, what's the future you want and, and how do we get there? So I'll pause for a second, and then I'm going to go to Adam first <laughs> to, to answer. Straight <laughs> into the hot spot. Uh, the future we want. Well, um, we, we've made it very clear what we want to do as a corporation in a broader sense uh, in terms of uh, addressing the topic of climate. And if we say we, we put sustainability in the middle of the strategy, then you have to deliver and be measured on it. It's climate. We're fully signed up to 1.5 degrees. We, Thank you. Yeah. We are part of the science-based uh, targets initiative and the race to zero. We are, and we have set steps to um, in the, the shorter, medium and longer term as to what we want to achieve in terms of uh, reducing our carbon footprint. And, and at the same time, hand in hand with that, how are we increasing the number of electric vehicles we have as a part of making that shift and making sure that we deliver through on that as well. So uh, we have a couple of different brands within the group. Mini and Rolls-Royce will both be completely electric from 2030. And BMW will be uh, much, much in line with the goals that are here for, for the, um, from the government to be uh, 50% at least electric by 2030. And then we'll push forwards from there where we can uh, create the change with consumers. That's all good and well to have the targets It's then being measured. So as part of that measurement, what we have is that in our annual report, we have a sustainability goals section. It's not just financials. It's not just a, a corporate update. 
we have our sustainability goals incorporated in the reporting and make sure that we are measured on that publicly. And that's what we will do to push things forwards. That's where we want to go to. Excellent answer. Alyssa, I'm going to have you go next. Mm -hmm. I know you've been put yeah, on the spot before. Yeah, right. You're in government. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, um, I think coming from public service, it, it's about um, our people and our residents. And um, as, as we as a city look forward, it's about making sure that our cities are resilient and sustainable, that the persons that have been historically left behind are raised up, um, that we address public health and air quality issues that are at the root of so much of the challenge that um, some of our residents face every day. Um, me personally, I look forward to, um, at the end of every day, feeling like what I've done during that day has just fed, like fed my soul and fed my need to, to do the work that I do um, around resiliency and sustainability. Love that too. Marion. I'm gonna share a dream uh, to answer <laughs> your question because when I joined the industry, I discovered that there is plenty of opportunity. And I mentioned the sustainable aviation fuel, so biofuel, and uh, basically you, you create an alternative to jet A1 fuel based on waste residues, for example. And in my dream, we'll have all the waste that we create out of our trip in a plane used to create biofuel. I don't know if I'm gonna still working in sustainability <laughs> the day will happen, but I think that day there will be a complete virtual circle of circular economy. Um, and I think we'll have to face few challenges. Measurement is one of them. I think it's how you measure. If you don't measure, it doesn't exist. Um, but yeah, my dream is, and you have to be positive while doing that work because sometimes it's difficult. The challenges, it's slow. It's not going fast enough, but you have to keep it positive and be optimistic. So uh, at least for my industry, uh, we're on the right path. We just need to accelerate the change. We, I'm not patient, so I'm, I'm working in the right, uh, the right world. But we need to accelerate. We need to be faster. And um, yeah, I like my dream, and hopefully, I will see it one day. Who knows? I was going to say, Marion, <laughs> we're in the metaverse now, so your dreams could definitely become possible. Kyle, uh, finish us out. Yeah. So um, when the IPCC report came out, there was an interesting article uh, from Forbes that was trying to explain why simply converting all of our, our, our mode split to simply uh, replace you know combustion vehicles with electric vehicles and the challenges that would that would create uh, you know especially with electrical grid and it, it was a very helpful article for me to understand but I think the the quote that resonated that I've been chewing on a lot is that given that we need to achieve these climate goals uh, and, and the challenge is, is large um, and that it's going to take more than just electrification, but also behavior change and, and mode split change. That it said uh, driving for trips under five miles in urban areas needs to become as unpopular as smoking inside. And that 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 really resonated with me. I, unfortunately, I don't think we can put like a Surgeon General's warning on driving under five miles in our cities. <laughs> Maybe I don't know, um, but. I would hope that instead of the, the, the like shaming of, of, of those sorts of decisions, we also realize the joy that comes in from micromobility, uh, whether you're on a, a bicycle, you're powering yourself or, or a scooter or an even, even a, a, a e-moped um, that we're reminded to get outside, to embrace our city, to smell the cafe nearby. And if you're in Seattle to get a little wet, and that it's okay to to show up uh you know to your location and have to dry off but you also were able to really experience your city and have fun uh getting around every day and so i hate sitting in traffic and i think that uh you know the more that people get outside and get on two wheels they're going to be a little bit happier wonderful way to close this out i was wondering uh at what point of this panel weather would come up and so i'm glad that you closed us out with that with part of that insight kyle um but would now like to invite the audience if you all have any questions we actually have a new mic so you don't have to use mine to uh pose the question any questions from the audience
on the mat. <laughs> All right. Sir, in the excellent hat over there, Adam, I believe that there is a mic behind you if you want to grab that. Well, why don't you just speak? Oh, well, thank you, if you don't mind. Uh, so um, I have a question for uh, uh, Air France, uh, Kaelin. So um, pre-COVID, what was very popular in Europe to connect airports to the metropolitan areas is the regional bus. So in Europe, the airlines would actually operate their own bus service from the airports to the city areas. So uh, one example is there was a very large um, ticketing area for Air France KLM bus services in Brussels Midi Station in Brussels. So, um, uh, how is it uh, now, post-COVID, that the bus services come back? Uh, my other question is, in Europe, there are the low-cost air carriers. Well, now, in Europe, there is now the low-cost high-speed rail carrier. So, WeGo is the low-cost high-speed rail carrier. So, how is that changing the mobility and the mode splits in Europe, uh, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, for the Brussels buses, um, I'm not the expert, um, but we're still in the crisis. We're getting out of it, but I think um, our routes, they're not completely fully back to, I would say, normal. Um, so I don't know specifically, but for sure, the inter modality is something very important and uh, something that the company in Europe is putting a lot of emphasis. On the train thing, it's actually a very, uh, very good question because it was in my talking point and I didn't have the chance to talk about it. But in France, we had for many years the train, train plus air tickets that give an opportunity for somebody that lands in Paris, for example, to take a fast train to another city in France. Um, and we're going to develop that more and more. Again, it's it's on the path for the sustainability roadmap to reduce, you know, carbon emission for routes uh, that can be done by a train for routes that are under uh, 2.5 hours, for example. And I think we need to explore that type of partnership because people are interested and we need to make it easy for the passenger. We need, and that's, I think, what we need to work on right now is working with these fast railway companies and making sure we offer them options that are easy, fast, one checking, luggage that follow, no problem. Um, and that's something that we are going to put a lot of emphasis in, in, in Europe. But we have to, in North America, we have to learn a lot from the best practices and the expertise that we have in Europe. And I think that's why I come up at the right time. I'm French and <laughs> I used a lot of the train when I was living in Europe. And so how we can work uh, towards that type of model that I think have some uh, chance to be developed more and more going forward. Excellent. And I've uh, actually been talking with a bunch of people from Commotion, uh, other attendees about the anarchy in Paris, AKA the cyclists and the biking that has gone up 40% apparently over the past year, um, which the New York Times insists on calling anarchy, but sounds kind of nice to me. Um, but I, I, you know, I, in terms of the US context, we have so much to learn from other countries around the world, um, not just in Europe. Any other questions from the audience? Excellent. Well, seeing that everybody would like to get to happy hour, I'm going to give Adam. I was going to, <laughs> yeah. say, I was going to say one thing. I was going to pick up on that whilst we were waiting for questions. Yeah. It works the other way around. The world has an awful lot to learn from the US and in particular from California when we're talking about climate change. And this is a great space and these are great events where you see how that's coming together, where you see the level of engagement of interest. Uh, and we need to take that momentum, you know, I keep coming back to this and build that forwards. And there's a lot that will be driven from this space here in helping make that change. The world is watching what's going on here and what policy is happening here. And, and then challenging themselves to try and either keep up or go better. And the more that we have that competition in policy to get better and better, whilst remaining realistic and making sure it happens, that's gonna be key to making sure we get the change happening. And it's a good point. I mean, where else are you all looking when you, you know, Alyssa, when you're trying to 
steal, borrow policy from somewhere else. Kyle, when you're thinking about, you know, where is the most innovative city that you're working? Um, you know, how are you all kind of borrowing from, from other places that are excelling in transportation innovation? When we are on um, national conversations, it is a relief to be in California um, for so many things. So when we talk about energy, when we talk about um, decarbonization of the built environment, um, we have a lot of backing and support from the state governor departments on down. And I don't think we that live in California know how much that is valued and how supportive that is to create on the local level where you actually can affect change, the policies and the laws that you need to do. Um, so I, I think California is a, is a great place and to, to look. Um, we still do look overseas and, you know, setting... Um, our city setting the, the 2035 carbon neutrality goal, we can't do the math to get there because there's still a lot that we collectively um, as a state, as a nation, as a, as a world need to solve um, together in those partnerships. Yeah, I mean, uh, so prior to working at SPIN with the Seattle DOT, I was on, somehow found myself on the tip of the spear of every bike lane, which is rather political. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, for me, I was constantly, obviously, you know, you look at Netherlands, you look at uh, Denmark and you know, Copenhagen, you, 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 that's the, that's where you want to be, but there's so many steps to get there first. And so if, I remember being inspired by Calgary, who, who basically did a pilot bike network, not just lane, network, overnight in their downtown. Um, cities like Vancouver, who have pretty much effectively built a complete network at their downtown, while US cities continue to, you know, every single time you remove a parking lane, it's like, it's like tearing down a bridge. Um, and, and so we took a lot of those lessons and we, we did our first protected bike lane in downtown Seattle on a week, weekend evening from like, we started at 10 p.m. And actually Ahmed, who I don't know if he's here, um, he works at CityFi, he was in charge of the signal team. He uh, took standard traffic signals and, and made a bike stencil to put over it. And so we had these massive traffic signals that are not for the bike scale, but we that was what we could do. And, and the, the line and painting crew came out and did this and us planners, or I was more like a plan engineer, uh, we met up there and we figured out how we could help. And so um, in the US and North America, the context has been pilot, protected bike facilities, show that it works, show that it can happen, and then from there, make it permanent. And now Second Avenue has beautiful planters the whole way, it has bike leaning rails when you hit the intersections, you don't have to dismount. Um, it's got scooter and bike parking the whole way. And so, you know, in 2012 was when, when we built that facility, uh, you know, it took a while, but now it's a really just beautiful, beautiful facility. And I, I want to actually acknowledge that Seattle is a, a city that we do look to and um, Denver, um, we look to Pittsburgh, uh, Miami Dade, who I think is here, um, Austin, there are a lot of great cities doing really great things. Um, and I think we should always be looking to each other to see where we can keep pushing. I agree. And, and recognize that everybody's different, right? So California is not Minnesota and vice versa. No offense to anybody from Minnesota or California. Um, but every, everybody's different, right? So, so you, you've got to tailor, tailor what you're doing to those different geographies. Uh, you know, Norway is an extreme case that everybody's looking at at the moment uh, for all the reasons that they've done it. Uh, interestingly, funded by money from oil, right? So, so you look at those examples or you look at best practices in China, we're a global industry. So we, we, we look at every space that's there, but each geography needs a slightly different solution. And it's how do you find the best and tweak it and tailor it so that it works for those different geographies. And, the, and the, you get, you pick people up where they are and move it as quick a pace as you can from where they are. Yeah. One of the words that a few of you used um, in your responses is pilots and not aviation pilots, but <laughs> piloting projects, although also that. Um, and I, you know, in terms of piloting sustainable transportation, a lot of people question, can, can you pilot that? I mean, transportation generally is a systemic 
it, it's a system. And so um, the, because there are so many issues uh, that are interconnected that make up transportation, is it worth doing a pilot? So I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, is it still worth piloting sustainable transportation? What does that look like in your, your various industries? Melissa, you look like you're yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. I mean, do it, just, just yeah. do it. And it'll, it's not as painful as, the, as people think. The unknown is very painful. <laughs> It, it is a huge part of education. So when we started with electrification, we started with the mini brand. And I'm going back now to 2008. And we had minis that were built out with, with, we took the back seats out. It was just two seats in the front. We had big old battery in the back. And we had people, and this was a, a classic pilot. We gave them to people. They had to drive it for, a, I think, six months or a year. We had two different streams. You had a notebook. You had to write down every day how far you drove. Uh, cause you know, with the range was whatever it was, I think about 70 miles, you had to write down how far you drove each day, what the experience was and, and, and log it. Cause this was really early phase in terms of, you know, how, how do we go to market? And it had a, it had many effects, but two key ones, one people learn that it's not that difficult. So they could engage with it and they realized that the majority of them, they're not actually driving that far on a daily basis. So you don't need a huge range. And you can still get by with your car. So that, that was the first thing. And obviously, we took a lot out of that from them explaining what the experience was with charging, with driving, with managing, driving, depending on how far you're going. Um, so there's always going to be a big benefit in doing it. And, 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 it, and it makes the change. Do you want my alternative microphone? <laughs> Try this one. This is probably oh, yeah. Try this one. <laughs> okay, this one works. Wow, look at I have three now. <laughs> um, uh, so my point was actually going to be that um, in the private sector, you know, um, prototyping products is very common. Pilots are the policy version of that, their product prototyping. Um, it's just that we focus so much on processes uh, that it's a, a important to um, have those pilots to do that. So um, given that I've now had two microphones turned off on me and that this has been a fantastic panel and you have been a um, wonderful audience to stick with us to the end, I wanted to thank all of you for painting the vision of the future for sustainable transportation, sharing some of what you're doing across the various modes, which is exciting, um, and also being candid about what some of the challenges are, which I know nobody really likes to do at 5.15 on a Wednesday, but here we are and we have to do it. So big round of applause for yourselves, for the panel, and for Commotion LA. Thank you again.